Hi, this is Adrienne Barbeau. Just call me Billy. Everyone does. And you're listening to withoutyourhead.com. All right. Welcome back to Without Your Head. We're now joined by Dean Cundy. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, how about you guys? Uh, I'm pretty good. Can't complain uh, myself. Old, but I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even about your call, are you? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> he, he wants an honest answer, I'm sure. <laughs> well, start off, uh, what films inspired you to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, become a filmmaker? Well, um, I guess I've been interested in, in film since high school. And uh, um, there were always uh, a couple of fantasy films, I guess, or action-adventure films. I know that um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the Disney film, um, was one that really caught my fancy uh, early on. <clears throat> and um, I, I think that uh, I, I really enjoyed the, the idea that with true film you could take an audience places they can't go in real life. You know, you can create worlds and situations and characters and all that stuff that, uh, uh, you know, that, that intrigue us and, and uh, allow us to sort of expand our, our uh, horizons and, and, and all that. So, so the, 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 the fantasy films and action films that I saw really sort of inspired me. And I guess that's one of the reasons I've, I've always uh, sort of gravitated towards those kinds of films in, in uh, the projects I've done. Mm -hmm. um, you got a question, John? Uh, at what age did you become interested in photography? Well, um, I, I think uh, pretty early on. I, I was uh, in elementary school and, and high school when I sort of took over uh, the family uh, filmmaking. My father had an 8mm camera and um, I, I started learning uh, probably when I was in about 6th uh, or 7th grade how to use it and what there was about exposure and, and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> that kind of stuff. So um, early on I, I, I made little uh, sort of family films. I, I did besides the vacations, you know, there were always my friends and I sort of recreating um, little scenarios so um, that sort of intrigued me in photography but uh, actually through high school and, and even into college uh, my interest in film was being an art director being uh, the, the guy who designed the sets and the environments and um, I studied architecture in college um, thinking that you know that's what I wanted to do was to go into film but uh, as a as a production designer mm -hmm. And um, then when I was at UCLA Film School, um, I took a class in cinematography from James Wong Howe. And uh, James Wong Howe was, was one of the great legendary guys who's, you know, done so many films. He started in the silent period. And when he was teaching the class, he was, I guess he was probably in his 70s and uh, sort of retiring. And uh, But he he really inspired me to go into cinematography because um, the, the classes sort of showed me that when <clears throat> when you're creating a film the most dynamic uh, sort of visual storytelling is being done with the camera and uh, so I shifted my uh, my attention away from set design and so forth into cinematography uh, about my second and third year of film school and uh, so when I uh, when I graduated from film school uh, I concentrated on cinematography and started trying to get work in that area. Uh, when you first started watching movies, was um, was like the technical aspect something you paid attention to? Yeah, I think so. I, I uh, as I said, I, I think that's what intrigued me the most was the fact that that you know here were a, a bunch of people, the filmmakers, the the director and the and the cameraman and all of the people that that I probably didn't exactly know who they were. I just knew that there were people who were creating these worlds and these moments and, and the stories and so forth. Um, and they were using 
for all this technical stuff. And I, I, uh, I used to visit periodically the studios. My father, uh, who was not in the business but uh, had um, you know, friends who were at the studios, uh, would take me probably once or twice a year down to some studio and and, and I could watch uh, a TV show being made or a movie or visit the sets and the stages and stuff. So I I kind of got an understanding of the the uh, some of the technique that went into making these films. Um, and I think that's always the part that fascinated me more so than than um, creating the the message or or whatever it was. How do you create the worlds, and how do you get an audience to believe mm -hmm. that they're really visiting these uh, wonderful places? Mm -hmm. uh, when you still watch movies, do you uh, sometimes like uh, pay attention at like how, how did they uh, do this shot? How did you know? How did they get the lighting right? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, um, I, I think I watch with two halves of the brain. Um, you know, the right side is is watching the. Uh, the story and the characters and, and uh, everything that you're supposed to be watching when you, as an audience. Um, and the left side is always saying, oh, that is an interesting shot. Oh, I, I understand how they did that. Um, you know, and especially now with, uh, with visual effects being such an important part of, the, of, of a film, even in sort of ordinary films, you know, they're, they're enhancing them with visual effects. So you're always sitting there sort of appreciating uh, what other people are doing and trying to figure it out, you know, it's sort of like uh, watching a magician work and appreciating the, the fact that he made a lady disappear, mm -hmm. but in the back of your mind you're always saying, I wonder how he did that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our fans here, uh, The Shape, he wants to know what directors from the past would you have liked to work with? Well, um... I don't know. I, I, I think uh, Hitchcock was probably very, very interesting, even though um, some people say that by the time he got to making the film, it was pretty cut and dry, that he did a lot of the making of the film beforehand with storyboards. Mm -hmm. I think he uh, still would have been a fascinating guy to work with. Um, but um, I, I don't know. Uh, th there are certain ones that um, that always sort of, got to do interesting films um, and and uh, I don't know if I would really specifically uh, be able to point to any of the old uh, directors but uh, you know any, anybody who made uh, great fantasy films or action adventures you know mm -hmm. I mean it, it was probably a great deal of fun to work on uh, Gone with the Wind uh, because you were creating a, uh, a world that didn't exist anymore, but it's doing it in such a, a vivid way. Mm -hmm. uh, you just talked about uh, Hitchcock. Was it like uh, nerve-wracking working on Psycho 2 since it's such an iconic uh, film? No, actually, that was that was really sort of one of my fondest memories because uh, we were doing it at Universal, which was the same studio. We were using uh, the Psycho house that had been built for the movie, so. Um, you know, we were we were treading on historic ground, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Hilton Green was the producer, and he had been the assistant director to uh, Hitchcock on the original Psycho. So uh, as we were rebuilding the sets, the interior of the house, the the uh, staircase, the um, various rooms, um, Hilton always would uh, be standing there uh, and his eyes would kind of glaze over and you could tell he was he was thinking back and then you'd say well so Hilton what uh, what happened in on this set and he he'd always have some kind of a really interesting little story or uh, you know an anecdote or something to remember about doing it so that we were really um, fortunate in that we were sort of walking with the ghost of Hitchcock uh, with us the whole time Mm -hmm. um, doing that, and it was we we had the um, the photo book um, where it, that had the film cut by cut that somebody had uh, uh, published, and uh, so we were we would replicate the, some of the shots almost exactly and put the props in the same place, and so it was it was a wonderful 
sort of um, revisiting, mm -hmm. uh, almost like uh, being there. Yeah, when when you do a remake, uh, not a remake, a, a sequel like that, yeah, do you really want it to, um, you know, be like like the first one, so you could kind of watch them back to back and have the same mood, have the same like look. Yeah, we uh, we really made a, a conscious effort to, as much as possible, um, give the feeling that they were watching the continuation of the film, mm -hmm. and um, you know, there was uh, even even though we were shooting in color, we we. We actually wanted to shoot it in black and white, like the original film. But uh, the studio said, "No, no, we we make all our films in color now." So uh, even though we were shooting it in color, um, you know, we we tried as much as possible to uh, duplicate the feeling and the, uh, the 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 idea that uh, if you ran them back to back, um, that there would be a, a sense that it was just like the old film and not too. Uh, not too updated and, and made too hip and cool, you know. What right. I mean? Yeah. Was that uh, something you intended to do with Halloween one and two? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, <clears throat> Halloween one was for me a great a great experience because uh, prior to that I'd been doing low budget films with uh, car chases and girls with machine guns <laughs> and mm -hmm. and um, you know just sort of action adventure. Uh, films that were were designed uh, for the the drive-in theater circuit when, that still sort of existed it was was kind of gearing down at that point, but they they still needed B movies, um, and now B movies are being made by the, the studios. You know, so mm -hmm. we we <clears throat> we've been making these films that were very quick, and most of the directors I worked with were. We're really just interested in interested in using the the camera to record the car blowing up and things like that. They they weren't really sort of visual storytellers. And when I when I did Halloween uh, one, uh, it was the first time I worked with John and and uh, met him. Um, it it was such a, a great joy to work with somebody who was interested in using the camera to tell the story, using the camera to, to draw the audience in, and it was not just putting the camera there to record an actor talking, but but how do you, in, you know, uh, increase the, the, the sensation and the experience and the emotion for the audience using the camera. So um, I really enjoyed Halloween 1 as, a, as a, an adventure mm. in a new kind of filmmaking for me. Yeah. And um, Halloween 2 was very much the same. We, we tried uh, um, you know, to sort of continue that uh, the feeling um, in Halloween 2. In uh, Halloween 1, you were, uh, I think you guys were probably one of the first people to use the panel glide, weren't you? Yes, actually we were. It was, was relatively new, um, and I had, uh, I had gone to Panavision, and they were demonstrating it, and, and the, the Steadicam was the... Um, of course, the original, mm -hmm. and and um, I had uh, a friend who had uh, showed us at Cinema Products, which was the company then starting to manufacture the Steadicam, um, this new device, and I, I put it on, and my camera operator Ray Stella uh, put it on, and we we kind of taught ourselves how to use this thing. It was a very unusual. Device and it took uh, you know it took a certain amount of skill to to learn how to do it. Now there are classes and almost everybody who uses it can take a mm -hmm. class to learn all the the nuances of using it. But at the time, uh, it was a device that was so new that we had to sort of self teach ourselves. And uh, and John was looking for a way to move the camera in a way that hadn't been done before. People were hand holding the camera, but he wanted it to to glide. And and really sort of give the audience an unusual sensation in, in watching a point of view, moving point of view. Is that something you so uh, enjoy? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, it, so it was a it was a new device, and we uh, we were experimenting with it at the time. Yeah, I was just saying, is that something you enjoy, like uh, finding like new ways to do something? Yeah, absolutely. I um, I think if you look at a lot of the films that that I've had the the uh, really good fortune to work on. Uh, most of them, you know, sort of 
go down new roads and you, mm-hmm. you know um, Roger Rabbit was mm-hmm. was very innovative in the mm-hmm. way it combined animation with live action uh, Jurassic Park uh, was the first time that that the computer had been used to create photorealistic um, creatures and to blend them in with uh, animatronic creatures of the large full scale uh, puppets that we built mm-hmm. and um, you know so I, I think a, a lot of the films and the, and the appeal to me on, on the films I work on involve um, new techniques and finding new ways and expanding the envelope of, uh, of the filmmaking technology was there any similarities between uh, Roger Rabbit and Jurassic Park since you know both like things that weren't really there yeah, very much so. Um, you know, the, um, the the thing about Roger Rabbit was uh, Bob Zemeckis had had said we want to always create the illusion that the creatures, you know, the characters, whether they're animated or whatever, are always there. And how how would you photograph them if they were really there? That sort of became our our watchword or our standard phrase is, well, suppose the rabbit really existed, how would we stage this scene and how would we photograph it? And um, so it was always thinking of, of the character first and, and how do you move the camera and how do you stage the action and how does the operator compose the shot uh, so that uh, you, you believe that the creatures are there. And Roger Rabbit led to um, to Jurassic Park, led to Casper, led to all of these uh, films uh, that now you know I, I directed the second unit on on Garfield two, mm-hmm. and it was uh, very much the same kind of thing you know trying to visualize something that's not there and do it in such a way that the audience accepts it because they are used to seeing uh, camera moves and and staging everything with with real characters, how do you get them to forget that they're watching uh, an artificial character and, and really uh, believe that they're there? Mm-hmm. Any other questions, John? Uh, during the filming of The Thing, were there any special effects that you're afraid wouldn't look good on film? Well, again, <clears throat> The Thing was a was very innovative in that the the special effects, the, the the rubber, as we always sort of tended to call it, um, uh, Rob Bottin was doing things that hadn't really been done, you know, with wires and air bladders and special materials and and um, you know, so we we were always looking at a a creature that he had created that uh, had unusual you know, characteristics and, uh, you know, movement that hadn't been done before and so forth. Um, but we were always aware of the fact that it was, in fact, a, a rubber thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, Rob was always, uh, you know, very kind of sensitive to the fact that we not, you know, just blatantly photograph it so it looked, you know, gave away. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that it was it was artificial, so a lot of what we did was with very very careful lighting to just bring out shapes and forms and little highlights and gleaming and areas of of color and and stuff and and movement, <clears throat> so that uh, we we're always enhancing the uh, the creature and not uh, you know not showing the audience where the seams were. Um, you know, on the documentary on um, on the thing on the DVD, you tell uh, Rob Oteen is really uh, into his work. Was there anything like he created that uh, you guys just didn't want to use in the movie? It was like too over the top. No, I think um, I, I think John was was really very anxious to um, you know as he always is trying to to. Um, Again, push the envelope when it comes to suspense and, and terror. So uh, he, uh, you know, John always sort of embraced anything that, that Rob wanted to do. And Rob, um, again, was 
completely into his work. I mean, he was not just a guy who was making this stuff, uh, you know, so he could get paid for it. Mm -hmm. um, he was he was truly an artist in rubber. You know, I mean, uh, he, he's a great sculptor. Um, you know, I've, I've seen uh, things that he's done just for fun and, and faces and portraits and characters and stuff that he's that he's done. And he's he's a great sculptor, but he's you know a very kinetic sculptor in that he he can create stuff that moves and morphs and and uh, looks very bizarre and very disturbing. <coughs> and uh, so um, I think I think we we were always looking forward to whatever. Rob uh, showed up with that day. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you got another question there, John? Uh, Casino Man from our message board, he actually had a question about Rob. He wanted to know if there's any uh, crazy stories on the set with him or anything like that. Sorry, uh, repeat? Uh, Casino Man from our message board, he had a question uh, about Rob. Uh, he, he actually wanted to know if there was like any uh, crazy stories you had about him. Well... <laughs> He, um, because he was so dedicated, he he was also very nocturnal. I mean, he would he would work at night a lot of times, and um, we were uh, always uh, sort of waiting for him to to deliver the stuff, and it would always show up kind of at the uh, at the end of a shooting day or whatever. And um, you know, there were there were times when. Uh, Something wouldn't happen exactly as he wanted. You know, we, I remember one of our very last nights of shooting. We were uh, shooting um, one of the the creatures. I think it was the one in the uh, that was morphing out of uh, of stuff in down in the ice cave. Mm -hmm. And uh, it uh, something went wrong. Some of the cables broke uh, because a lot of the movement was controlled by cables that were on pulleys and then would run off to the side and the puppeteers would pull levers and get arms to move and things to bulge and and when they, they broke uh, it was like our last shot and uh, Rob said well it'll, it'll take me a little bit, I'll, let me fix it, it'll be a few minutes and uh, the few minutes became a little longer and and uh, John was a little nervous and uh, when, when can we go and I know Larry Franco, the producer, was saying Rob, why, Rob, what, how, how, how much longer? I mean, uh, oh, it, it'll just be a few more minutes. So uh, I remember we were at the very end of a long day, and uh, a few of us went over to the side and kind of laid down on some furniture pads and in some chairs and on the couch and stuff. And we, mm -hmm. we dozed off and woke up uh, the next morning. <laughs> we had slept all through the night. And we said, oh, my God, nobody called us. I wonder what happened. So we, we rushed over to the set and uh, said, oh, Rob, sorry, we're, we're ready to go. We're ready to go. And he turned and said, oh, it'll just be a few more minutes. <laughs> well, being a guy from uh, California was, uh, did you find it too cold working, uh, you know, filming that movie? No, actually, um, you, you kind of get used to uh, changes of environment. You know, I mean, we... Uh, in, in film, we travel everywhere from incredibly hot, steamy jungles to uh, up to uh, Alaska, where we were shooting um, the thing. And um, you know, sometimes it was 20 below zero, but uh, we we were just well prepared. We had winterized the cameras so that uh, the the uh, lubricants and the machinery didn't freeze up, and and we had uh, um, all kinds of heavy clothing and layers and and um, we had we had to be very careful because the uh, the lenses if you if you're outside shooting and they get very very cold if you take them into uh, an in warm environment mm -hmm. um, they all of the humidity in the air from uh, inside the room wherever you are immediately condenses and fogs up all over the lenses and they also get inside because the air you know will leak through and uh, it'll start to coat inside the lenses so the lenses are essentially useless so we had to uh, build an outdoor camera room that always stayed 20 below 
just like the outside. So if we if it started to snow or or uh, we were done, we would take the equipment into this room, but it couldn't be heated because it would uh, immediately fog up and ruin the equipment. So the the camera assistant never had a chance to to uh, warm up because uh, as they would uh, take the camera inside to reload it or or change the lenses or whatever, it had to be as, just as freezing as it was outside. So uh, some of the crew never got relief from the uh, the cold. Were you happy with um, how everything turned out in that movie, like the the finished project? Everything. Yeah, I think so. I I was watching it just the other day. Um, <clears throat> because I I picked up the uh, the special you yeah know, special edition uh, DVD mm-hmm. DVD uh, just to see what uh, what it was going and, and and I hadn't seen it for a long time and um, I actually was relatively proud of what we did I mean particularly mm-hmm. for the time and the the budget um, we um, you know there, there was quite a bit of really interesting uh, kinds of things and. Um, you know, John was, uh, you know, again one of those uh, films that I looked at with with pride for having, uh, you know, been able to work on on something that had great visual storytelling and innovative effects and and so forth. So I uh, I think it's a uh, it was a great great experience at the time, and then I I look back at it with uh, you know you always look back and say oh I wish I could have fix that or I hadn't mm. done that but uh, for the most part I think I'm uh, quite proud of it yeah uh, I actually picked that up on uh, HD DVD and it looked uh, phenomenal uh, I'll have to check that out mm-hmm. well, speaking of DVDs do you think um, like a, a full screen DVD um, is a way to go or would you prefer the widescreen well I uh, I I think that uh, when, when we when we make a film, most of the time you're you're really composing for the the aspect ratio, the shape of the frame. And there's there's two basic uh, frames: one eight five um, and um, and anamorphic or two three five. Um, and what that means is the the ratio of how high it is to how what the width is. One eight five is is not quite as wide a uh, a frame as the 235, which is 2.35 units wide for every unit high it is. So, so uh, when when we compose, we're composing specifically for uh, those aspect ratios and and for the to create the, the mood and the, the look and and the information and everything within the frame. <coughs> so when when you have a, a, a DVD that fills the kind of square frame of a uh, almost square frame of a conventional mm-hmm. television, you are <clears throat> cutting off the sides mm-hmm. of the image that uh, you know we we intended. So I think that uh, anybody who really wants to appreciate a film should always look for the letterboxed mm-hmm. uh, version of it uh, and the books the the uh, boxes and the DVD. <laughs> sleeves it will all say letterboxed version or, or whatever yeah, why that's the one that that assures you you're seeing exactly the same thing that was intended when the filmmakers made the movie mm-hmm. um, uh, I, can never, I can never forget all the classic Dean Cundey rain scenes like in Jurassic Park Halloween Back to the Future and Psycho 2 there was a great one do you like working in the rain? well I like it when when we control it ourselves, yeah, uh, and m- most of that rain is all uh, created. You know, mm-hmm. put rain bars and sprinklers and everything overhead, and that gives you the chance to uh, to start up the rain only when you need it. <coughs> Working in the real rain um, can, can really be it's sort of difficult because everything gets wet, and and your equipment is always wet, and you don't have a chance to to cover it up when everything's dry and then just turn on the rain so but it rain is always such a great moody uh, kind of feeling for mm-hmm. the film. since you worked with uh, John Carpenter so often in your in his early films did you have like a could you like know right away like how he'd want he'd, how he'd want a scene to look yeah I think uh, 
Um, that's one of the advantages, I think, of working with the same people uh, over and over again, uh, whether it's working with the same director or, in my case, very often having the same crew, the same gaffer who helps me with lighting and, and uh, camera operator and, and so forth. You, you build an understanding of, of how you want to do things. And, uh, <laughs> and so what it does is it allows you to get past the, the, um, the, the long explanations and you can almost point and, and grunt and, and uh, you understand exactly what it is. And, and then when you are going in for the, the closer angle or you're, you're turning the camera around and shooting the, the opposite direction, uh, you know what's intended and why the director wants to do a certain thing and, and the crew knows why I want to do a particular thing. You know. So it, it really allows everybody to contribute more to creating the film rather than trying to learn each other's language. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you ever like uh, disagree with one of the directors and uh, offer your own opinions? Yeah, I think uh, you know that's sort of sort of natural. I mean, I I think that uh, for for a lot of the, I've been very fortunate in working with directors where you know you, you don't have to disagree because you understand that um, they know what they're doing, uh, that the choices they're making are are um, you know ones that are well thought out and and further the the purpose of the scene or the movie um, and by the same token um, you know I I'm always appreciative when a uh, when a director um, will sort of accept my suggestions or enhancements or, or whatever <clears throat> because uh, you know that it usually means you're all working on the same movie. Or, you're, you know, Both you trying to understand make what it is you want to do and, and how make to it do it. Make it the best again. So, so it's um, it, it's always um, you know, great to uh, to to work where you don't have to disagree. But uh, I mean, every now and then I I will work with somebody that um, um, you know sort of doesn't understand you know what what it is I'm was trying to do or mm -hmm. the suggestion I was making how it was going to help or enhance or whatever and um, you know it, it becomes more sort of disappointing than anything else you know I I, I rarely get uh, upset about anything but I, I do get disappointed now and then in that uh, you know you, you, you miss an opportunity to, to do something interesting or different mm -hmm. You ever get disappointed, uh, like if a scene that you worked hard on uh, gets uh, you know cut out of the final film? Yeah, I think that um, that's always something that. Uh, although you know, I guess the converse is true sometimes that you, you know you knew that the scene wasn't working and, mm -hmm. and or it was very difficult to do, and, and when it got cut out, uh, you know, you said, "Well, that's a relief." But I would say more frequently, it, it, it's the other way where. You know, you you spend time and, and effort, and you you create something really interesting with the lighting or the camera move, or you know. Um, and and I know, like Bob Zemeckis is very ruthless when he gets to the editing room. He mm -hmm. his feeling is that if if the shot or the scene doesn't enhance the movie, um, and it slows it down or whatever, he's he'll he'll just cut it out. Uh, no matter matter how much time and effort he spent on it or we spent on it you know they're just um, whole sequences that are that are gone and uh, um, you know sometimes it's you know you, you go to the screening with and come out with a little regret that you didn't get a chance to see how well that other scene worked but uh, you know if if you don't notice it's missing um, you probably didn't need it Thank you. Question, John? Uh, the Tales of the Crypt uh, episodes that you worked on, w w were those with uh, Robert Zemeckis? Uh, yes. Um, the, uh, those were ones that uh, Bob had done, and, uh, and it was um, you know, kind, of, kind of fun because I, mm -hmm. I've actually done very little television, and, uh, of course, he hadn't either. And uh, so it was 
uh, again, sort of forging into new areas for us at least. I mean, a lot of people do TV all the time, and, and they do some great stuff. But uh, it's always fun to to uh, you know be challenged by something new. Were well, you familiar with like the original EC Comics, uh, Tales from the Crypt? Um, only as a result of uh, doing the uh, show when when. Uh, Bob said uh, that I want to do it. Uh, you, you know, we we looked at some of the comics and uh, and uh, you know as as sort of the guidelines. But uh, I I hadn't really uh, seen the comics before that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think now with like the DVD more DVDs coming out, there's so many um, special features on them that like uh, cinematography is more appreciated now? Well, yeah, I I, I kind of. Like the idea that the uh, that the DVDs uh, are not just um, sort of the movie that you missed in the theater, or the movie you wanted to see again because you liked it in the theater, but it's it's also it, it's helping the audience to appreciate you know what goes on in the creation of the film, you know, mm -hmm. and hopefully they have more appreciation of of the craft and art that goes into creating the films and uh, you know there are people who say oh well they're giving away the secrets and all that I, I think that um, you know that's that's part of the fun of of um, the DVDs and, and film is um, you know the appreciation of uh, of the craft and the fact that these <coughs> these stories aren't you know, aren't made in an hour and a half that uh, of you know what you were watching. And, I mean, a lot of people up until recently sort of thought that uh, you know you had a camera and these people acted, and then maybe the next day you did another scene, and and it uh, it only took a week or so to make it. And, and um, <clears throat> the fact that uh, people can begin to appreciate. The, uh, the the effort and the creativity that goes into making the films, I think, is a is a great thing. You know, it's a, it's sort of, sort of like <clears throat> taking a a class in Shakespeare and um, understanding, you know, the the time and the effort and the and the uh, the art of of what you know was done in creating those plays and that literature. <clears throat> you know, the the film is. Is the literature of our times, you know, and some of it's really bad and some of it's really good. Mm -hmm. To be able to, uh, for an audience to be able to to appreciate the the effort and what makes it good, and and uh, who are the people who are creating it, uh, you know, it's, I think it's a it's a very good thing. Uh, what film would you be most proud of that you've worked on? <laughs> well, that's always kind of a a hard thing because. Mm -hmm. it, Different films for different reasons, you know. I mean, I I always kind of look very fondly at Roger Rabbit for the for the the work that went into it, the mm -hmm. the innovative uh, you know kind of creativity that was involved. I mean, Roger Rabbit changed not only the way live action and animation is done, but animation in general. Um, you know, after that, uh, the, the the animated features that came out started having tone mats, uh, shadows, and highlights, and moving cameras, and all of the things that uh, we very deliberately did on Roger Rabbit has shown up in in other filmmaking. So I think um, uh, for, Roger Rabbit has to be one of my favorites. Um, I think Back to the Future. Um, is one of my favorites as an all-around film. The, mm -hmm. the, the story, the characters, and the uh, the effects, and and the uh, the, the journey that uh, we were able to take the audience on is it's one of the most sort of fun, complete films that I've worked on. Um, and Jurassic Park, I think, for for its um, um, you know the, the the use of the computer generated creatures for the very first time um, when we started the film you know we didn't know if they could do it uh, mm -hmm. uh, industrial light magic uh, and Dennis Muren said they 
at a meeting one day, they thought they would be able to create these creatures in the uh, computer, uh, but they weren't sure. And uh, over a period of time, we saw them gradually develop the techniques and uh, and so forth. And um, for it to be the the first one that really sort of integrated computer creatures into uh, it was is very kind of rewarding and, and satisfying. So um, different films for different reasons, but mm -hmm. um, each one was always sort of going somewhere where uh, filmmakers hadn't before. Um, since Roger Rabbit was uh, you know so big, are you surprised they never made a sequel? Um, yeah, actually, and and there was intentions to do sequels. Um, there were at least three versions, I think, that were in development at various times. Uh, one was the uh, the prequel of uh, who was Roger and how did he get in to Hollywood? You know, he he presumably was a uh, uh, he grew up on a small farm in the Midwest and and came to Hollywood and became a star just like uh, you know so many humans did. And then there was another uh, version of Roger Rabbit where uh, the uh, that takes place in uh, shortly. Uh, before um, the, uh, the the uh, film that was made, um, where the uh, all of the tunes are drafted into uh, World War II, and uh, they go overseas to uh, entertain the troops, and uh, then get involved in some uh, heroic uh, adventure. Hmm. Uh, you know, so there were there were various uh, versions of things that uh, came up, but I. I think there was um, always sort of creative differences that kept it from being made. Mm -hmm. Think we'll ever see it? I don't know. I would sure hope so. I mean, uh, <clears throat> you know, I I think it's certainly time to uh, to do something with uh, with it and to to take it to the next step of uh, mm -hmm. interactive um, filmmaking. Uh, earlier, when you talked about uh, like Halloween one and two. That they look so much uh, similar, like like they were filmed almost together. Do you think they did a good job on Halloween H two O to make it uh, seem like it was a sequel right from those? Yeah, you know, I, I when I when I went to see it, I, and I went to the uh, premiere. I was invited to the premiere. Mm -hmm. um, I I went with a certain amount of trepidation because uh, you know typically uh, when you start to get down to that number of sequels and and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. They become sort of mechanical, and they sort of run uh, out of of ideas. But right. um, I, I think the fact that uh, Jamie Lee Curtis uh, was involved really gave uh, a lot of credibility to it, and mm -hmm. um, you know, it was one of those uh, films that um, you know made a very valiant effort to uh, to measure up to the originals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't like. Um they didn't send them to outer space or anything like that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they, they, they were wise in uh, really sort of going back to the roots. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about uh, Rob Zombie remaking Halloween? Well, it's, <clears throat> I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't heard anything uh, about it as far as uh, how it's, how it's uh, come out or what it's going to be like. But uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, you know, you, you always question remaking something that um, that was was actually pretty good or innovative at the per, in the first place. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there are certain sort of classic films that would be uh, a mistake to remake. You know, uh, some of the old ones like Casablanca and mm -hmm. Gone with the Wind. You know, it's uh, as much as you could you could try to update them. The uh, there's something about being able to look back with nostalgia at that original version and, and say, well, that was pretty good. Uh, and I, I kind of think the same with leaving Halloween 1 alone. Um, you know, the, is there is there that much you can do to improve it? Uh, yeah. You know, it doesn't, doesn't really require that you update the uh, the effects or, or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, John? Uh, actually, back on Halloween, um, uh, I know Carpenter, he was pretty heavily influenced by Dario Argento. Did he have you uh, view any of his films or anything for the yeah, work on actually, Halloween? Yeah, we, um, 
We actually did. Um, and we looked at uh, Suspiria, I mm-hmm. think, uh, for one. Um, you know that. Um, you know, and and it was he, he he was one of the few filmmakers at the time I think that was that was doing a similar kind of of suspense um, terror horror that that was a, a lot of it was uh, sort of visceral and and uh, emotional you know it didn't require a great deal of blood and and uh, slashing to create the uh, mood. Mm-hmm. So uh, I know that was that was one of the things that John uh, really wanted to do. And when we got to Halloween, it was all about uh, we won't need blood. We're just going to scare the audience with the uh, the camera and uh, the mood and lighting and everything. I uh, wonder our fans want to know if you had any uh, Ox Baker stories from uh, Escape from New York. Um. Was he a professional wrestler? Um, n- no, not not really. I mean, that that whole sequence in the ring was um, really kind of a just a fun thing. Uh, you know, we we really enjoyed making Escape from New York in general, but uh, the ring was um, just one of those great uh, um, sort of interludes in the uh, in the movie that uh, you know mm-hmm. I'm sure you could you could cut it out and you'd still understand the story of the movie but it did so much to sort of enhance the, um, the, the you know the, the journey that Snake Plissken goes through mm-hmm. um, and create the, uh, uh, the the whole the whole mood of um, of the island and what the uh, prisoners were doing for their own entertainment that it was a, it was a great fun sequence uh, was that a hard movie to uh, light the scenes in, since it's uh, mostly with like a fire and it's pretty much all at night? Yeah, it was. Um, it, it was definitely uh, sort of a great challenge. Uh, it, we we had um, a couple of sort of advantages. Kodak had just come out with uh, a a faster film that uh, didn't need quite as much light. Uh, Panavision had also come out with uh, their new uh, super speed lenses that uh, allowed us to uh, shoot without uh, uh, as much light, and um, and we had also uh, they had just started manufacturing the HMI light, which was um, which is a, now sort of the standard of, uh, of you know shooting in daylight and night exteriors, <clears throat> but at the time. Uh, they were we were dealing all with all new sort of technology that showed up at just the right time for us to uh, to be able to to use it and uh, I was determined to to shoot with very as little light as possible to create sort of a natural uh, look and uh, without uh, pushing the film without overdeveloping it which would tend to give it a little more grain and and um, make the blacks not quite as black so it was a case of uh, trying to use the technology and yet uh, make a very dark and uh, sinister kind of uh, feeling mm-hmm. um, so it was uh, w- was actually fun in, in again pushing the envelope with uh, the new new technology and and creating a, uh, a a film that was really kind of unique I mean nobody had really done that sort of bizarre kind of gothic uh, world you know now you know, you know it's not an unusual thing to see in uh, in all kinds of films you know the, um, the 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 unusual fantasy moment but but uh, it was really you know very very innovative for for John to come up with the that whole idea and and uh, for us to be able to capture it, it was, it was again, a lot of fun and, and um, sort of groundbreaking as far as taking film in a direction. Uh, which is more of a, like a learning experience, working on a, a more low-budget movie and trying to figure out how to, um, how to do scenes within your budget or on a, on a big-budget movie, uh, just learning completely new things like in Jurassic Park or um, Roger Rabbit? Well, I... 
I always enjoy working on low-budget films because I think they they um, they really make you work smart. Um, you know, you have to be as innovative as possible in order to create um, you know moments and mood and style and stuff. Um, it is great to have the money to build a, a, an unusual set or to to use you know new equipment and technology and, and uh, all of that so I mean each of them have their advantages you know the, the big budget film tends to be to to uh, to have a big budget because uh, it's going to allow you to go somewhere that you couldn't if you didn't have the money mm -hmm. um, but at the same time the low budget film really stretches your creativity you know so I, I think I, one of the reasons I enjoy going back and forth is that they can sort of enhance each other. You know, when you get on a, on a low-budget film, you can remember, you know, something that worked really well when you had the money, and maybe you can find an alternate way to create that special shot or the scene or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you work on a uh, big-budget film, you know, you... You remember the the innovative, creative technique that you had to develop on the low-budget film because you didn't have the money or the equipment. So now it allows you to to apply that that unusual sort of technique. But now you've got to, you know a bigger set or or some uh, you know more uh, equipment that you can do it with. So so they they really. You know, you can make it make each one and enhance the other. You know, if you sort of alternate back and forth. Uh, somebody wrote a question here, MJ Simpson. And they said that um, when they interviewed you, you had recently directed Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves, and that you were um, keen on doing more directing. This one, though, um, if you have any uh, anything you'd be directing in the near future. Um, yeah, actually, I've I've been uh, interested in continuing the directing, you know, that's why I, I did the uh, director of the second unit on, on the last Garfield film because it, uh, it's, it's really fun sort of dreaming up the shots and, and, uh, and the scenes and doing the storyboarding and stuff yourself, so, uh, um, but I've, I've actually got a couple of, uh, of scripts that, uh, that I'm hoping will, uh, will happen, um, you know, I, I keep, uh, Sort of developing them and and, uh, uh, and promoting them, but uh, nothing uh, nothing firm. Although there's a couple things on the very close horizon. Uh, since Halloween three was you know it didn't have like the, the same story as uh, Halloween one and two, did you still want to make it uh, seem the same, like the same mood or anything? Or did, was it you just wanted to be uh, completely different? Well, the the original thought was that um, maybe the Halloween films could become a series of films that the, the common threat really was the, the, um, the holiday, Halloween as a, um, uh, an event during the year that um, you know, would sort of um, inspire some kind of a, a story or you know, a, a film that was that was sort of centered around the holiday mm -hmm. concept of Halloween, um, and uh, so Halloween three, of course, takes a completely different direction. There's no Michael Myers and, and all, but it is about Halloween. Um, but the, when uh, when they asked me to to do it, the idea was to sort of give it the a similar kind of feeling. Um, and um, so that's that's what we did. We sort of, um, you know, tried to make it visually uh, kind of similar, um, so that that would be the sort of the common thread. Um, <clears throat> after the fact, I think uh, they realized that the Halloween was really about Michael Myers and and all that. So they went back to that as a common uh, sort of uh, idea. Do you think it would have been accepted better if it if it just was uh, if it wasn't Halloween three if it was just um, a purely different uh, picture? Um, possibly, yeah. It, it may have, uh, I, I, and I think they 
the realization later was that people were sort of misled, um, you know, not in a in a really conscious way, but just uh, you know, you you see Halloween one and two, and it's about Michael Myers, so Halloween three must be the same, <clears throat> and. Uh, um, when it wasn't, people said, oh, but wait, where's, where's, uh, where's the evil guy? Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think, um, you know, had they, had they made it and used, uh, you know, something else, just a uh, season of the witch or something, mm -hmm. um, then perhaps the, it would have been more generally accepted as just, uh, a, a movie that took place at Halloween as opposed to one that was supposed to, uh, you know, continue a story. Yeah. I always liked to drink when I was a kid. Eight more, uh, eight more days to Halloween. So yeah, sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what what advice would you give to uh, somebody who wanted to uh, work in films? Well, it's um, it, it, it's interesting because it the the business cycles um, it goes up and down as far as <clears throat> um, all kinds of things. Uh, the kinds of stories that are popular, um, how films are made, uh, the the size of the box office. They're, these are all different factors that you know cycle up and down. and one of the things that cycle up and down is also your ability to to get into the business. You know, when I first uh, started out of uh, film school, it was very difficult because it was. Uh, pretty much a closed industry as far as the, the studio business. Um, I wasn't able to get into the union and into the, the major studios. But um, I was I was lucky in that there was sort of the, a period when uh, there were still B films being made and it was a place to learn. And um, I, I think there's no film that I worked on that I in any capacity that I didn't learn something and and um, there's no there's no credit on my uh, resume that I that I sort of remove or look at you know embarrassed because <clears throat> no matter what I, I learned by working mm -hmm. on these low budget films and I think the period is is coming around again where um, you know that that, that there are opportunities for people to learn and one of my things that I always advise people is always take any job you can get even if you don't get paid you know you, you should never look at it as uh, oh I've been asked to work on this film but they're not going to pay me so I'm, I can't do that you, know, you always take it because you can you can learn uh, almost uh, anything uh, off of uh, almost any film you work on, you'll you'll learn something about the process, about the the politics, the the uh, procedures, um, and you know you, you always uh, find ways to contribute. And 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 I'm a I'm a big believer also in that um, you know that, that, that there's this kind of Philosophy, I think that uh, that the, the, they say you should never sort of go out and look for a job and then ask how much you're going to get paid. No matter what what it is, whether you're working in the, the store or you're you know you're trying to uh, learn a new craft or or working in film, um, <clears throat> you know that you you always go with the idea that. No matter what it is, you're not going to say uh, your first question of your prospective employer or your filmmaker who's uh, inviting you to join. You, you, the first question should never be, well, what are you going to pay me? Uh, because that classifies you, and in your mind, it makes you say, uh, well, the only reason I'm doing this is for the money or I have to get compensated for it. Mm -hmm. You always go in saying what can I contribute and how can I be part of this and how can I join in it and you'll find that the money and the ability to support yourself follows because people will realize that you're really interested in learning and performing 
and being better at, at what you're doing. <clears throat> and that that leads you up the ladder of of employment and compensation and so forth. So um, so my my advice is to is to try to do anything you can to learn your craft, uh, to to network, to work on somebody else's project and and deliver a hundred and ten percent because believe me uh, it gets noticed and it gives you the next opportunity and it opens doors um, for you to to be able to to do something in a in a in an industry in an art form that is has been classified as the most powerful art form that man has ever invented uh, it moves more people in more ways than anything else and being able to work in it is a uh, for me a great privilege and and um, you know for anybody to be able to to work in it you, you have to view it as as uh, you know a great a great privilege and and something that very few people get to do well we uh, really want to appreciate we really appreciate you coming on tonight and want to uh, thank you mm -hmm. for the interview well, it's my pleasure. I and, uh, very much. Uh, is there, there's anything you want to uh, tell your fans out there before they let you go? Um, well, no. I just want to thank all of them who have watched movies over the years and watched the ones uh, that I've worked on and and have appreciated it. Um, you know, the, the effort that so many of us put into creating films that are, you know, generally for the most part entertainment. You know, the the idea is to to give people a little experience and an adventure into in a world somewhere that they can't normally go, and for for people to to appreciate that and be fans, I think is uh, is is something that I uh, I really appreciate, and I, I thank them all for for uh, the interest and for the support over many years. All right, so one last thing is uh, Chris from Tangle Salon says hello. Oh, very good. <laughs> uh, well, I uh, I hope he's uh, listening, and uh, thanks, Chris, for the uh, haircuts over the years. This is PJ Souls, and you are totally listening to Without Your Head Horror Radio.